Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are excited to be welcoming back to the show Dr. Mark Faber. Dr. Faber is the editor and publisher of the Gloom, Boom, Doom Report. He is also the director of Mark Faber LTD, which acts as an investment advisor and fund manager. Mark is a legendary investor, originally from Switzerland. He is famous for his uncanny financial predictions. Several years ago, Mark was nicknamed by the mainstream media as Dr. Doom because of what he saw coming in the economy. So, Dr. Doom, welcome back to the show. How are you today? Well, thank you very much. I'm fine, and I hope all your viewers and you are also fine and enjoying the various lockdowns or the opening of the economy, whatever it is. Whatever it may be. You know, we are always so privileged to have you here. It's always very interesting because you are considered to be the messenger of doom at least a decade or so ago. And you were a complete lone wolf back then, Mark. It's very interesting how things have transpired. I want to start off by talking about the global economic structure. We're going to cover a lot of great topics with you today, the economy, inflation, your latest predictions. But talk to us about what is happening on a global scale economically. Well, you know, things don't move uh, that fast and uh, we have trends. I think if you look at the last 200 years and so forth, we have a trend to increase prosperity. There's no question about this. And especially after the breakdown of communism and socialism, the implosion, I'd put it that way, uh, we had essentially 3 billion people that before were chained and uh, lived in kind of a slave-like conditions, become free and uh, they were able to uh, express their desires and also follow their ambitions. And therefore, you had very powerful growth rates in Eastern Europe, in Russia, in Central Asia, and in India, and especially in China. So this is uh, the major trend that has occurred. And if you look at the last 20, 30 years, it is very clear that where I say in the advanced economies, in particular in the US, nothing much has been done about the infrastructure in China. You've rolled out airports, bridges, tunnels, and uh, highways and uh, rapid train systems that are unprecedented, not only in terms of size, but also in terms of the speed at which they were actually built. Uh, The other day there was an article that uh, described how China had built the largest dam in just about three years and ahead of schedule. And these are the things that have happened outside of the US. And I think that instead of always criticizing China and its leadership, the Western world would do better to consider how was it possible that a country like China was able to become a modern society within just 30, 40 years. And they've become a modern society. I mean, you go, uh, as an example, I used to live in Hong Kong until year 2000, and there was next door a place called Shenzhen. And in Shenzhen, there was nothing, just like in Pudong in Shanghai, there was nothing, just fields and agriculture. Today, Shenzhen has a population that is larger than Hong Kong, and it has a GDP that is larger than Hong Kong. And this is just in 30 years. So the changes are mind-boggling. And when I look back, I saw some of the changes coming, and I wrote a book in the uh, year 2001, uh, Tomorrow's Gold, Asia's Age uh, of Discovery, 
And that was about the progress that was going to happen in Asia, uh, not only in China, but also Vietnam and in uh, India and so forth. And I think these changes are here to stay. They are for the Western world uh, not dangerous. They offer opportunities. But, of course, if you believe that you are the superpower of the world and the policeman of the world and that uh, your philosophy or political philosophy is the right one, it may become dangerous because, as you know, we have people in the Western world who are very belligerent and they would like to, in a perfect world, they would like to have war with Putin. <laughs> in a perfect world, they would like to have war with Xi Jinping in China and so forth. So uh, we have, aside from the threat to society that is internally, that is very obvious, we've moved to the left and uh, we don't know exactly who is running the government, certainly not at the present time. And we also don't know exactly about the origin of the COVID, but it seems that something is a bit fishy about it, <laughs> to say the least. And so we have all these uncertainties, and at the same time, uh, aside from being confused, the population being confused because of that, they're also fearful, and uh, the government has then started to pay them money. In other words, essentially MMT, uh, basic incomes are being uh, given to people even if they're dead. But uh, uh, that keeps the population halfway happy. The question is, of course, you know, how do you measure? Is the economy expanding or contracting when you print money? For sure, if you walk out of your house, of your studio, and you go down the street, you will see that economic conditions in your area are not the same they were one and a half, two years ago. There's much less traffic. Uh, small businesses have to close down. A lot of them will not reopen, and so forth and so on. This has all been obstructed essentially by booming asset markets from, uh, co from cryptocurrencies to stocks to bonds to commodities and so forth uh, to home prices. It's remarkable. Most home prices in the U.S. are much higher than they were in 2007. And we all said it's a bubble in 2007. Mm -hmm. You know, right. That's such a huge point that very few people are making right now, Mark, is that in 2007, 2008, it was a gigantic real estate bubble that crashed. But right yes. now, prices are so much higher than they were then. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's and just, incomes are not higher. Right? You know, in, th this is a problem. They've printed money. As a result of that, everything has become more expensive. Uh, home prices are not only higher because of increased demand, but they're also higher because, say, lumber prices, uh, they have gone up four times in the last 18 months, four times. Oh, wow. So... This adds to the cost, and uh, you and I, we actually, well, I know roughly how to calculate it, but most people don't know how to calculate inflation, and uh, it's actually uncertain because for your lifestyle, the inflation rate is a very different one than for my li lifestyle, or for a family in the U.S. That's, that has two children, that go to school and so forth, uh, their inflation is much higher than yours and mine. So uh, how to calculate precisely is difficult to tell. But uh, I can say that uh, at the present time in the Western world, 
with zero interest rates, everything is very difficult to value. And everything is also uh, in a very precarious uh, position in the sense that if you have high interest rates, it restricts the size of the government from expanding a lot. In other words, if the government borrows money, they have to pay interest on this money they borrowed, and it increases the deficits and it increases uh, the ability or it diminishes the ability of the government to pay the interest on their debt. But at the present time, with zero interest rates, okay, we can spend $10 trillion on some additional military expeditions. We have to find some countries that are completely useless to invade, as was Afghanistan and Libya and Iraq and uh, Syria. But uh, we, we can find some countries that, uh, <laughs> where we can spend $10 trillion, even if $5 trillion flow into our own pockets. And the socialists can say, okay, it doesn't cost us anything to borrow, so let's distribute $10 trillion to homeless people and to uh, new immigrants that come into the U.S. undocumented. We just give them $10 trillion, make them happy, and give them um, permits to vote. It's... Um the system has become dysfunctional. And I think we are at the stage where we may very well end up within the next few years with a huge mess and a dictatorial takeover that some, you know, unpleasant dictatorial power takes over. Uh, the question is, will it be more right-wing military complex or will it be more left-wing like uh, say the bolshevik revolution <laughs> to oh. yeah, to mention an extreme yeah. you know so many people don't even know the history of the bolshevik revolution people and it really scares me to hear someone such as dr faber say this because you've made such extraordinary predictions over the past decades that everybody, you know, oh, come on, you know, he's, he's off, he's Dr. Doom, you know, but the truth of the matter is, if anyone were to look that up, we have almost the identical thing happening. What they did was they took over the media first to make everybody believe a certain thing. And then they went from there. <coughs> sure. You, you confuse me, but actually, uh, there is a very good book about this, you know, by uh, Hannah Arndt. She wrote about uh, the totalitarian state and how it comes about and how people readily accept it because they're, they're confused and they live in fear. Uh, there's one thing I've noticed, and probably you've seen it as well, and also your viewers. Uh, we have already curtailed free speech dramatically. We have academics at universities, they've been sacked because they had certain views, not offensive views. I have to patriotic that. views, Dr. Faber. Mark. I beg your pardon? Patriotic views. It's, you know, we've been yes. so brainwashed out of loving our own country that we, you know, we'll, we'll give up every right. Well, you know, it's okay to test everybody, you know, and it's okay to search everybody. And you, you should have no problem with being searched if you don't have anything to hide. That mentality is so poisonous to our country. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, when Hitler came to power uh, later, some books were written and they described exactly that they took first measures that would only touch one group of people. <coughs> so the other people said, oh, never mind. It's not me. Say, mm -hmm. 
it's not me. It doesn't concern me. I'm not Polish or I'm not Jewish or whatever it is. It doesn't concern me. And the next measure came along and again they said, well, I don't do that. It doesn't concern me and so forth. And, but by the end, uh, everything was taken away and there was nobody left to oppose these measures because they had all shut up and never resisted these measures that didn't touch them directly, but touched the freedom of other people. If you're not willing to stand up for other people's rights and for your own country and for your laws and for the things that have kept you safe and kept your country the place everybody wants to come, then you're going to lose it all. This illegal immigration, Mark, it's being supported. It's being paid for by our money while we have homeless people all over the place. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. we have, we need our money, number one. Number two, laws. Laws make us safe. People who are against laws don't understand. Laws make us safe. Guns make well, us safe. Our we not only need safe. laws, we need the strict application of laws. There's no point to have a death penalty if you never hang anyone. You understand? Mm. You have to be very strict. You have the laws, and who breaks the law has to be punished harshly. It is only then that people are, you know, extremely safe. Right. Uh, say in the Middle East, you can go arrive at an airport. As you uh, take the suitcase off the belt, you put it on the floor. You can go anywhere, change money and so forth. Nobody will pinch your suitcase. <laughs> yes, because theft is punished very harshly. Oh, this is one of the right. huge crimes. Also in Singapore, uh, the laws are applied strictly. So if you do drugs, if you do small quantities and you're caught, you're going to be penalized. But if you have large quantities and the suspicion exists within the law, that you were actually dealing in uh, drugs, it's a death penalty. <coughs> wow. I have a friend. He's from a very, one of the richest families. <laughs> he have, I don't know whether for his own consumption or for his friends or his parties. He had uh -oh. like a kilo of ganja, in other words, marijuana, <laughs> cannabis. And he was cold. And luckily, he was from a very good family, and they had all the good lawyers and so forth and so on. And so he went to jail for five years. But had he been poor, from a poor family, obviously the suspicion would have been that he is a dealer. And he would have been hanged, period. Oh, wow. You know, I have to make a point here. I'm all for legalization of cannabis, but I'm not for breaking the law. I'm for the legalization of <laughs> cannabis, changing the laws. If we break our laws, whether it's immigration or whatnot, we give up our guns. Mark, I want to speak to the fact that a lot of people think, not necessarily our audience, but many Americans believe that you know, the Second Amendment, guns, and strictly following laws, and getting illegal immigrants out of our country is being harsh. They have this naive thought that having guns is just dangerous for us inside of our country, and we're killing each other, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, when reality, the <laughs> fact that we have guns keeps us safe from other countries who will readily come in and take over our nation, not because they want our people, but because they want our land. We have Americans that are so naive as to believe that we live in this bubble. And that if we announce that nobody has any guns anymore, and everybody's very, very poor now, and our money is worth nothing, that we are not a sitting duck for another predatory nation. And that's what I want you to speak to, because um, how much of a threat right now is communism or socialism or another country 
Um, I know right now what the answer is, but I'd like you to explain the reality of the situation. Well, the reality is like this. Uh, we have in the former communist countries, including China, and India was never communist, but it was socialist and very socialist. And it pursued policies of isolation uh, that retarded economic growth. And also in uh, Russia, where you had, uh, at the end, you didn't have communism. You had a totalitarian state. You know, it was a t total control by the party of the life of people. Because the Bolshevik revolution, the idea was, you know, you essentially make everybody the same. In other words, you have a... You, everybody you, will have a wonderful... You, you implement what socialism should be according to, say, Marx's uh, teachings. But actually... Already uh, in 1922, Stalin came to power. <laughs> Stalin, about the last thing he was interested in was communism. He was interested in his own power and how to rule Russia under admittedly very difficult conditions. So he wasn't, uh, you cannot say that he was a socialist, but he was uh, totalitarian ruler. And nowadays, I want to tell you, there is no threat in a million years that uh, China or Russia or Eastern Europe or Vietnam will go back to socialism, communism, for the simple reason that they suffered so badly right, under these regimes. It. About the last thing they wanted to see again in their lives is a socialist, communist uh, type of um, s system of society. But in the Western world, the young people, yeah. the so-called woke youth, <laughs> they think that the government should do this, the government should do that, and so forth, and hand out money, and so forth. And uh, that's where the threat is. I don't think for a minute that any country would be as stupid as to try or even think about invading the U.S. when they can invade it easily through illegal immigrants. That's exactly what I was going to say. We're being grows. invaded right now, right? Yes, but Europe is even worse. At least you have the Hispanics. <laughs> we have the North Africans. <laughs> So, I mean, I don't know what you prefer, but I'll tell you, in many uh, European countries, there are areas where not even the police goes anymore. They are run like, uh, you know, um, uh, under Sharia law or like an African country would be run. The situation is in Europe quite bad, and we have precise statistics. Uh, what the percentage of, uh, say, Muslim are today as a percent of the total population, and how much they will be in 20 years. In some countries, uh, we will have a Muslim majority in 20 years for the simple reason that uh, Muslim families tend to have like six, seven children, whereas Western or French or Belgian families, they have maybe one or two children or you know none what? at all. And this is purposeful too, because they want to grow their numbers because they consider that a takeover. So they literally, you know, they discuss it amongst themselves. You know, I want to bring up one point, just going back to socialism and the people here in this country that are just coming out of college that have been taught these um, ideas. Mark, <laughs> what they envision is they've everyone... They've been brainwashed. They've been completely brain, brainwashed. What they envision literally, when you talk to them, 
is, you know, everyone has the same nice house and everyone has the same great wardrobe and everybody has this great income and everybody has healthcare and blah, blah, blah. They don't understand that when they talk about, when you talk about equal and you hand it off to a dictatorial government, what you have is basically an equal cardboard box next to the guy that was homeless two weeks ago and his cardboard box. Everyone has the same lowest denominator possible while the rich rule and all of society, mass society, become incredibly enslaved paupers with maybe one shirt and again, a small place to live. If you have five in your family, give us your $2 million house, we're kicking in the door. It's gone. You've got exactly the same as everybody else. And that's what they don't understand. You have these fashionistas and these Hollywood celebrities in $2 million or $12 million houses <laughs> talking about socialism. Everybody should have the same with this bizarre fantasy of what that means. It doesn't mean everybody has the same fabulousness. It means everybody has the same <laughs> horrific life. And that's what Dr. Farber is trying to get to. That's why people, it went into communism and dictatorialism and their life just, you know, we got to bring this home of the reality. They're living in the fantasy land of what they envision equal to be. You know, I, I would recommend once your viewers, there are documentaries about, say, Russian artists or Russian conductors who stayed behind. They didn't leave Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution. One of the most famous pianists is a man called Stavislav Richter. Richter. In German, Richter, because he was half German. And actually in the movies, a documentary, they show some of the communal houses people lived in. He was at that time under Stalin already an incredibly well-known pianist, <laughs> certainly in Russia, but also overseas. He just couldn't ever leave Russia because they were afraid that he would jump off. But he uh, showed in the movie, the documentary, some of these communal homes. And he described how they lived in a house, in a commun communal house in Moscow. Uh, they had a small two-room apartment, not two-bedroom, two-room. And he and his wife shared it with another couple that had three children. And in the room, there, were no, there was no bathroom. Uh, there was on the floor a bathroom. And you can see how people are lining up in the morning and in the evening. You, you know, people don't realize yeah. that capitalistic society has many shortcomings. I do not deny that. And it's been also abused in conjunction with the government at the expense of lower classes. There's no, no question about this. But at the same time, I want to say this, as Ms. M Milton Friedman explained it, that's why they never quote him, because he's anti-socialism. <laughs> but, but he explained very clearly that the capitalistic system is the only system which has lifted the lifestyle of most people, not everybody, but most people, and that even under the capitalistic system, the poor people live at the much higher level of wealth than under socialism. Under socialism, as you pointed out, everybody lives in cardboards. You know, this is a dream to think that under socialism and communism, you will have a nice little home uh, like in Beverly Hills <laughs> or in, um, I don't know, Venice in, uh, or uh, Hollywood or anywhere is, is not going to happen, has never happened, because uh, there is a strong disincentive to work <laughs> under socialism, and people don't really care because they get the same salary like the neighbors. So 
if you get the same uh, marks at school like that, like anyone else, what is your incentive to prepare an exam? Like, well, you get the same marks from the teacher because uh, it could hurt the uh, feelings of someone <laughs> to have lower marks than you have. <laughs> God forbid we hurt someone's feelings. Well, I've, I've always had lower marks than anybody else. <laughs> Me in too. Never hurt my feelings. So that's why I'm a little bit crazy. <laughs> I'm suffering so much in my use. <laughs> you know, it's such a, this is such an important conversation for people to really get into their minds because, again, you just said it. Western people, Americans right now have this fantasy world that everybody being equal means they keep their same lifestyle. It's just everybody <laughs> else has a bunch of money. They don't understand the progression that happens, the Bolshevik revolution. Again, everyone being convinced to walk into their own chains, basically. They, you know, they start off convincing you that, you know, somehow you're being ripped off and everybody should get a universal basic income and then nobody goes to work. And then all of a sudden, all the companies start to close down. Then what are we going to do? The government takes over all the companies. The government runs everything, gives you your UBI, and then you do something wrong. Your check doesn't come the next month. Uh-oh. Who did you talk to? Did you say something wrong? Did you wear something wrong? You become a slave. And then not only can you speak, you know, <laughs> but you, you can't speak. You can't do anything. You can't go certain places. You can't talk to certain people. And then all of a sudden, literally a boot kicks in the door of your $4 million house and says, you are out. And that's what happened when the army takes over of another, of a socialist or a communist regime they own everything and they govern you because you can't go get a job now because there's no jobs left. Your freedoms are gone. And now to feed your kids, you have to yeah, do yeah, it sure. I mean, this is also, you know, in these, that's why I like to watch these interviews of people who stayed behind, A, uh, under Hitler, but also under Stalin. Because you can see what really happened and how people lived. I mean, under Stalin, they were famous artists. They didn't sleep in the apartment, but <laughs> in front of the apartment, mm -hmm. because they were so afraid that someone will, would come and pick them up, and they didn't want to disturb their families. So they slept on the porch. <laughs> oh, my gosh, because they didn't want yeah, to scare like, their you know, kids. This is the reign of terror. And it, it's not the last time we had it in uh, Russia and in Germany. It's going to happen again. You know, and uh, there's lots of people in companies. Uh, they don't dare to say anything anymore because they're afraid that if they say or criticize something, they're going to be sacked. Right. And when your mortgage is on the line and your kids are on the line and your food's on the line, you yeah, can yeah, say sure. what they want you to say. Yeah, yeah, sure. There was an expression for that. These are Mitläufer. They, they are not endorsing the system, but because of their fear, they just think it's better to participate in the system it's easier. than to just, you know, oppose it. Right. And that's why they're allowing this... Um, lockdown on freedom of speech because half of our country feels like well it doesn't affect us well it doesn't affect you until you lose your country to <laughs> what you are trying to bring in this ubi <laughs> this <laughs> universal basic income is poison <laughs> people will sit at home do nothing it's the beginning how long would it take from people sitting home doing nothing until the government owns everything and then all you need is a really bad personality to come in and say, you know, you, all you need is a Stalin. <laughs> you know? I have, uh, quite a few I could mention in the U.S. among the bad personalities. Well, I, I will now refrain from doing so. <laughs> <laughs> it's a scary situation. Realistically, Mark, are we under this threat right now? What, 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 do you, what, kind of, what do you see? Especially you're in northern Thailand right now, right? Well, I mean, you, you see, we in Thailand at the present time, and we never had really a democracy. 
and uh, the poor people are not really interested because they know that wh whoever is in government, it's not going to improve their lifestyle. Th this is a country that uh, is built around the system that is very favorable for the wealthiest people, for the wealthy families and so forth, and unfavorable for poor people. Poor people have uh, the mobility upstairs is very limited. There is some mobility. I mean, say my gardener is an analphabet. He doesn't read and write. But his two children, they went to school and one is a school teacher. I'm not sure how much or how suitable she is as a teacher. But did you call him an kid. alphabet? Did, Mark, did you call him an no, alphabet? He, my staff, he doesn't know how to read and write. Is that what you call them, an alphabet? I've an alphabet. Heard that term. An alphabet. Or illiterate. No, illiterate is uh, someone who is not cultured, but he doesn't know how to read and write. He knows how to dial telephone numbers on his mobile. <laughs> that they know. The other servant I have, she's the, just the housework and cooking and so forth. She uh, has no husband because he ran away when the baby was very young. This is uh, quite uh, usual in Thailand. And uh, she is uh, IQ-wise not very high up. <laughs> but the daughter now... Uh, she studied, and now she's going to become a nurse. I mean, a, a real nurse, not, you know, just changing pots at night. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know, I so mean... So there is some opportunity, but you understand, even these people, they have the opportunity, but they don't, they earn very little. You know, to move from that class into the upper class where you earn a lot of money is a very difficult step, extremely difficult. But they don't need that much money. I mean, both my employees have cars. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they steal from me. I don't know. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Maybe there's cars. something you don't know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. So who knows? Yeah, that's just, I mean, for people in this country to not appreciate what our forefathers fought for and died for to create the Constitution, to protect us and to give us the opportunity to, if you want to sit at home and eat Doritos, that's fine. But if you want to build a company and build a life and build, you know, a major success for your life where you take care of your people. And when I talk about success, what I'm speaking of mostly is you're able to protect those you love. Because what people don't understand is if you fall into a subservient place, if something should arise, whether it's a huge bill or whether it's, you know, your pet needs surgery or whether you're being attacked, you know, if you're not in a position where you can defend yourself, you can't help anyone else either. And it's a spiral down. And you see, uh, this is exactly uh, what I think as well. And actually I'm just writing about this because I've written about this before, but this is a very famous uh, writer he passed away already, but he wrote, among others, this, the servile state. Can you read it? He was a friend of George Bernard Shaw and of Chesterton. They were, you know, the famous writers in Hold those Hold that up days. one more time for us, Mark, so I make sure we get it. Hold that up, please. Uh, 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 yeah, okay, here. Can you see the title? Yes. Hilaire Belloc. Great. And anyway, he says, well, you know, Schumpeter already had the theory that uh, capitalism would, uh, would end up in socialism. But his theory is that the basic state or condition of man is a condition of... Uh, 
slavery, that most people are slaves and there's a ruling class uh, ruling the slaves. And in that context, probably democracy such as we had in the last 150 years or so was an aberration and it will prove to be unsuccessful in the long run and will move back into some kind of less free society. That would also be my view. Most people will not notice it because like, you know, say in Indonesia, we had the Dutch, it was a Dutch colony. In India, it was a British colony. Now, these colonies, the majority of people didn't did know who was ruling the country because they were in the countryside and obviously the Dutch soldiers, they didn't come up and down the countryside. They were just in the few port cities. The same in India, they were in the cities close to one of the kings in India, because there, there were many kings, the Marahaja. And uh, therefore, I think that most people actually, when they lose their freedom, will not even notice it very much because they don't use it a lot now. They don't speak up, you know, they work or don't work and they just watch Facebook and that's their lives and so forth. So they may not uh, have, feel very much of a difference, but the people that work and uh, that, as you said, build up the country, that like the people that build up Western civilization with a legal system that functioned, uh, with uh, a system of property that allowed people to make inventions and, to, and allowed all the progress to take place from the 17th century onwards. Essentially, this uh, society uh, may actually not exist in future. In other words, uh, the heydays of Western society are probably over. The heydays. And from here onwards, and that's why I always say, you know, when people ask me my advice, I say, you better enjoy your life now <laughs> because it's likely to get much worse. You know, that's almost what I was afraid you were going to say because I knew what we were going to talk about here. So that is your... But it doesn't mean that it will affect your wealth immediately you know, before we go from A to B. There are many stations, many phases, like in the phase that we've been, COVID-19, uh, many of your viewers, not all, but many, will have increased their wealth considerably because they had assets. So during COVID, stocks went up, Bitcoins went up, Ethereum went up, and so forth and so on. And uh, commodities went up. So if they were in these markets, they made money. True. But the people that, but the 50% in America that has nothing, they obviously didn't participate. Uh, they are worse off, relatively speaking, than before. Right. I want to switch before we go real fast to yes. um, talking about where you would advise everyone to be, um, precious metals wise, in terms of what you see. Also, I want to get your timeline on this. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's a complicated I question, like I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is this tomorrow, Dr. Faber? You know, you know, I mean, I know it's a progression. It's just we're at the beginning of it and we can stop it. That's what's so frustrating to me is if, if you know what's happened over and over and over in history and that this is the same footprint, you can stop it. It's just that so many people don't see it, so you're like yelling at the wind. Mm -hmm. It's obscured by lots of different factors. 
the government says it's an emergency, so people think, yeah, it's an emergency, we have to do this and that and so forth. Uh, they don't think that maybe the government is uh, just using an emergency to contain their freedom. Or, you know, the Fed says, oh, it's an emergency, we need to print money. They may not realize that by printing money, uh, they obscure the fact that the economy is not doing well, period. This is the reality. But assets go up and so people have money to spend and so forth. But uh, the economy obviously cannot survive on millions of people with a printing machine. <laughs> you know, that should be clear to anyone. But uh, I think the timeline, I would say we are at the stage where things will accelerate. First of all, uh, the rhetoric between the US, the hardliners, and foreign countries has become very um, hard. In other words, you know, they accuse Putin of this and of that, yeah. and uh, they blame China for this and for that and so forth. And I can tell you a lot of people in the world, they have obviously a different view about this. And uh, all you need is one day someone to lose his nerves or you need a false flag. You know, sometimes uh, they can stage an event mm. that then leads to a provocation and then uh, war can break out. So I, I think that is a possibility we have to reckon with that uh, will be sliding into a warlike situation. Number two, I think that... Uh, the move towards socialism in the U.S. has uh, progressed so far that it will go all the way or be arrested or stopped by a military intervention. That is a possibility. But as you know, the military is now also becoming vogue. <laughs> <sighs> they know, have now in the new tanks, they have little tables to change the nappies of babies. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. anyway, I think as an investor, what you should do, you should diversify and you should have some assets outside of the US, but not, say, by you buy Sony shares and you hold them in the US. No, you buy foreign shares and you hold them also in a foreign country. What's your best country? What, can you get a little specific for us? Well, that uh, depends on the condition of each person. But if you want, uh, say, a legal system that functions, an economy that functions, an economy that is likely not to be touched by warlike activity, I think Singapore would fit the bill. You know, I think China would not, uh, China enjoys to have something like Singapore, uh, US enjoys to have something like Singapore, the surrounding countries enjoy to have kind of a neutral free Singapore. So I think it's relatively safe. I'd uh, also say Dubai is probably quite safe. Great. One, one more. <laughs> so everybody has... One more. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Hong Kong is quite safe because now it is under China. And, and the sense. US will no longer meddle into Hong Kong's affair. I think they've learned their lesson. Okay, so we've got Hong Kong, Dubai, and Singapore. I just wanted to... Yes, I mean, I, I still think places like Monaco and Switzerland and Liechtenstein are okay. But uh, anything 
that is far away from a socialist country. <laughs> it's uh, quite okay. Or <laughs> Great. W- where the socialists have little power. I tell you what, this is just... In the U.S., I suppose that Texas is also a better place than, say, um, Baltimore and yeah, right? Michigan and uh, New York. <laughs> Oh, New York, for sure. I mean, you know, we're having pictures now of socialist cities in the United States where they, you know, are even having garbage pickup now. I mean, just that one factor, you know, when you don't have garbage pickup, I mean, you just take a look at the country of Venezuela, when you have garbage pickup for a month, you know, you got a big problem. When you, when you just have all of your people don't realize that when an economy stops, when people stop working, they can't even envision what happens. You know, the garbage doesn't get picked up anymore. And, you know, the, the, the rats take care of it. Hmm? The rats take care of the garbage. <laughs> it's like people are looking, oh, that's a disgusting country. Well, guess what? That's a country where people all have equal income and sit at home. And they're waiting to get pampered and taken over, yeah, and they don't right. see, I mean, uh, you know, that what's about to take to them see, over. Uh, if you want to see what socialism brings about, and if you really like it, uh, all the immigrants that want to come to the U.S., they should uh, actually turn around and walk back to Venezuela. Right. If they like and socialism wisdom. and wisdom and leading the column. Uh, you can send uh, AOC and all these characters. <laughs> I say anyone that wants to change our country should just go to a country that's already established in the way that they yes, do. Yes, absolutely. Period. Yes. Instead of changing yes. us, go to Venezuela. Yes. And yes, especially absolutely. all these people that are influencing people. If you hate our country so much, yes. leave, leave, <laughs> you know, um, I I don't mean to sound harsh. President Trump said that. And it was just like, oh, my God, I can't believe he said it. I'm saying it. You don't like it. Leave. Why are you here? You know, if you can't come into our country. He was right about many things. The tragedy is that he surrounded himself with nimbots, you know, people that were very uh, liberal leaning, left leaning that didn't, uh, and that were members of the deep state. You know, a lot of his, the people that he installed in his administration were deep state people, Washington. They didn't belong or followed his policies. They followed the policies of the unistate. You know, it was almost like when he got there, he didn't have the choices that we thought he had. It's almost like he was forced into some choices because you look at it now, he's a businessman, you know, a businessman. He would know. He has instincts. You know, I just, uh, I don't think. I agree with you. If you look at him and you look at Biden, (laughs) they're not taking decisions by themselves. They are told what to do. That's why I say the system has advanced already very much into a, a government that doesn't care about uh, people, people's votes. They run the government and the president is just a figurehead. They program him. They wind him up every morning. <laughs> <laughs> so... You mentioned this at the beginning of the interview. You said, we don't really know who's running the government. And I'm presuming that you meant in the United States. What are your thoughts? Well, I think uh, this administration is largely run by Mr. Obama and by Susan Rice. Unfortunately, unfortunately, but I don't know for sure. And this is it in the today's situation, as was the case in previous governments, not in the US, but say in Russia and in China and so forth. It's very difficult to pinpoint the finger and say he was responsible. 
because it's not written down. Interesting, interesting. So it's like, uh, you know, who is responsible for the execution of these and those people? Everybody will say the orders came from upstairs. <laughs> yes. Right, right, yes. higher up, yes. up, way up there. <laughs> Mark, this has been amazing. It's always amazing to have you on this show. I want you to Thank mention you. your website and your newsletter, please. Gloomboomdoom.com. <laughs> there it is. And your newsletter can be found there too, right? Yes, yes. Okay, perfect, perfect. Do you have one last bit of advice for everybody? Well, I think that if I look at the valuations around the world, you know, which stocks are expensive, which markets are expensive, which currencies are high, which currencies are low. Right now, I'm saying right now because it changes uh, sometimes quickly. Right now, the Turkish lira is very inexpensive and uh, the Turkish stock market is also very cheap. So in America, there's a Turkish ETF listed called T, uh, the symbol is TUR. I think uh, it is okay. It may still go down a little bit, maybe 10%, but I think the upside over the next five years is like between 50 and 100%. Number two, uh, we have this argument and discussion about Growth stocks and value stocks. As you know, value stocks around the world have grossly underperformed growth stocks. But emerging markets have also underperformed developed markets. So in emerging economies, you have some stocks, so-called value stocks, small caps. They are incredibly inexpensive compared to developed markets valuations. So as an investor, he should look at emerging economies and invest some money. I'm not saying that he should put all his money into these uh, emerging market stocks, but he should invest some money in these uh, value stocks, low PE stocks, high dividend stocks, uh, in those countries. This is my last message. Beautiful. The golden nugget. And of course, thank you so much for coming on this show today. Well, thank you very much for having me. This it's always nice talking brilliant. to you. Although uh, this discussion was not the most optimistic one. I know. Well, Dr. Yeah. Doom, what can we expect? You know, well, we wanted it's the better reality. to be prepared, yes. you know, than to think, oh, tomorrow will be fine. These the realistic people that survive the best because they live in the present and they know the future is unknown. It can be better. It can be worse. But at least they don't live always believing, oh, tomorrow it will be better. Mm -hmm. You live in reality and build your life that way. Dr. Farber, thank you so much for coming well, on this show today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, Michelle. Bye -bye. Take care and have a nice weekend uh, also for your uh, listeners and viewers. <laughs> thank Beautiful. You. And I want to repeat your website one more time. It is gloomboomdoom.com. Gloomboomdoom.com. Yes. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Yes.